We move on to our keynote speech tonight, the lecture of uh, Professor Jonathan Duby. Uh, Professor Duby uh, is also known the troublemaker of uh, Ben Gurion University. He's a professor of physics and theoretical chemistry. I'm also an uh, expert in this area, but we will talk about it after. <laughs> He's a member of the Department of Chemistry at Ben Gurion University of the Negev, as well as the Katz Center for Nanoscale Science and Technology, and the, uh, and the School for Sustainability and Climate Change, also, of course, at Ben Gurion University. His scientific interests include in electri electrical and in energy transport in nanoscale system, nanotechnology, energy conversion, and photocatalysis, and more. I, um, I did some uh, tests before uh, trying to pronounce these uh, terms. He is also one of the founders of the Israeli Forum for Rational Environmentalism. We will be happy, about, by the way, to, to hear about this uh, forum and, uh, and what does it mean. Professor Duby will talk about the future of energy. And uh, please. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank the organizers for uh, uh, inviting me. It's really great. And um, so I'm a professor of uh, theoretical chemistry, but um, during the last few years, I've been thinking a lot about energy and power. And then it deteriorated to climate and environmental issues and so on. And after a couple of years of thinking about this and understanding, as I will try to show you a little bit today, that we have it all wrong in many, many ways. Um, uh, me, together with uh, several colleagues, Boaz Arad is one of them, um, we um, founded what we now call the Israeli uh, Forum for Rational Environmentalism, which is really, you know, in a way, it's just an infrastructure group that we have among us, which has a lot of knowledge and know-how and, and numbers people and economists and, and physicists and geographers that try to balance the picture regarding climate, environment, and energy policies. Because like in so many other fields, we have it wrong, and we see it in economics, we see it in the free market, we see it in, every, in a lot of things. And, and in this global thing of climate, environment, and, and energy, there are many things which we get wrong. We, I mean the government, and of course the public, and the media, and so on. And so I was um, invited to talk about the future of energy, and I will try to make it brief so we can have some time to uh, discuss. And I'd like to start by pointing out that we live in a, in a world where now we have 8 billion people or so, and around 3 billion of those w use energy in a year as much as an average American refrigerator. That's just the statistics. If you live in Africa, you're most likely not to have power. You know, when, when we in Israel and in the US and in, in the Western world, we plug our a, a computer to the socket or, or the charger, we're not thinking twice, well, are we going to have electricity today? That's not something that comes to mind. But if you live in a place like Africa or Central America or Southeast Asia, that's actually a concern. Even in places which are slightly better, like South Africa and Malaysia and Indonesia and places like that, that's not always the case. India, which is the largest democracy in the world, only two years ago um, electrified all households. That happened two years ago. That's it. And that's, you know, this is Indian statistics. I don't know if it's, they don't have power all the time. They do in the cities, but in the rural areas, they don't have power all the time. And this is important. We were backpackers in, Israel, in India. We know, we know this, yes. And this is important. And the story begins with power. Power is energy per unit time. Energy 
being a physicist, I can tell you, roughly speaking, is a measure of an ability of someone, something, some object, to change its environment, to do work on it. And this is what human beings have been doing since we uh, climbed down from the trees. We are changing our environment in order to make our lives better. And to do that, we need power. And it's interesting that in English, power has two meanings, right? One is energy per unit time, and the second is, you know, power. But that's not by chance. And as humanity, we started by exploiting two forms of power. One of them is the power of fire, which is concentrated heat in terms of while, when you burn brush wood or then start chopping wood. And we use that form of concentrated power to heat our homes and cook our food. And the other form of power is using animals, which, is, which are way, way stronger than we are, right? We started to using cattle and horses to move around. This is where the unit of power, horsepower, comes from. That's the amount of work a horse can do in a unit time. That's not by chance. That's by evolution of the term. And then something amazing happened. We started to discover other sources of power. You need to understand, even the people who live in Africa today are essentially better off than the people who lived in Central Europe three or four hundred years ago. That's an amazing statistics. Three hundred years ago, 95% of the population lived under the absolute poverty line, roughly three dollars a day equivalent. Child mortality was one, to one in five. The average age was about 45. And your chance of dying from a, a, a meteorolo meteorological event was substantial. Your chances of dying from hunger, from starvation, were substantial. People were suffering. And that was the state of affairs. That's how humans lived. And then something amazing happened. We call it the Industrial Revolution, and you know there are economists and maybe historians in the crowd. They're going to debate forever what are the causes of a, a, the, the Industrial Revolution and why it happened there and not here in the Netherlands and in, B, in UK or whatever. But if you want to summarize the Industrial Revolution in one word, that word is power. This is the true engine that drove humanity out of existential poverty. First through coal that saved the forests in uh, uh, Europe, because coal is dense wood, essentially. It burns much better. Then through oil, which saved the whales, because till oil was found, whale fat was the central form of illuminating houses at night. And then we switched to oil, we stopped hunting whales. And then to natural gas, and then uh, uh, to where we are now. What you see here is the uh, amount of power per capita as a function of the air. And you see, we started with, you know, it's called, it's, there's a beautiful name for that, biofuels. Biofuels is basically brush wood and cut wood, right? You burn wood. That's not a great way to make power, because it's not very dense. And then we switch to coal, and then we switch to natural gas, and then we switch to, uh, sorry, oil, natural gas. And now we have some uh, uh, mixture of uh, fuels with which we make power. Notice that um, solar and wind power, which we'll get to in a second, they don't even appear on this scale. And there's a reason for that. You can see the improvement that power makes uh, to the lives of people through this wonderful, wonderful ad that I like very much for case kerosene tractors. Tractor is a machine that substitutes human labor. That's it. 
That's what it does. Instead of having 100 people work for 10 days, you need one tractor. And with that tractor, you can actually send your boy to school. He doesn't need to go to work in the farm with you. You can send him to school. This is an amazing example of how power, which is basically the ability of machines to do our work for us, liberated people out of poverty, allowing them to go to school and then uh, think, have time to think, and invent new things, and invest in new technologies, and make our lives even more better. But as I said, that's not the case throughout, uh, all around the world. We're going to return to this image later. This is a picture of the Earth at night. Some people say I'm a climate denier, but I do believe that the world is, is round. This was not taken in one shot. Yeah, needed to have a satellite orbit the Earth. And we can see where work is done. We can see where we change our environment. We can see the Western world, and we can see the, uh, um, the dark world. You can see Central Africa, Central America, Northeast Asia. Three billion people live in these dark places places. Think about this as we go along. And although we now understand how important power is to human flourishing and to ability of people to go uh, uh, beyond the poverty line and make their lives better, winds are shifting. Winds of crisis. Uh, if a few uh, if you know down to dozens of years ago nations were struggling to get as much power as they can we now hear a different theme we hear countries saying we don't want power we want something else we don't want to invest in very good sources of power coming from fossil fuels or a, a nuclear power or whatnot, because there's a climate change and there's a climate crisis. And it's all due to CO2, which is all due to man-made. Now, I'm not going to go in this talk on the details of the relation between CO2 and temperature, but I do want to pinpoint a few points regarding the climate crisis. And unless you just landed from another planet, you must have heard that we're in a climate crisis, right? And this is a driver, an engine, to many, many policies regarding energy which are affecting people, and affecting people's lives, and are affecting people's freedom. And I will touch that a little bit. And this is just, you know, uh, uh, a tiny roster of, of things you might see uh, glazing over various journals. This I love the most. It's Antonio Guterres, the uh, um, secretary of the UN. And he now says that, you know, climate crisis is the cold red of humanity, a World War II of this generation. However, being a, a physicist, I tend to stick to the facts. I tend to look at the data. And Crisis is not a an, um, word from the realm of science. Crisis is, is a word from the realm of human experience. And so one needs to quanti quantify climate uh, crisis. So how do you quantify crisis? Well, you think about bad things that can happen, and you say, how much are they happening, right? You need a measure for that. And lucky for me, people have done that. A lot of scientists are actually measuring what we would call, you know, bad things in terms of meteorological events. And they were actually accumulated in um, um, a report which was recently uh, uh, submitted by the IPCC, the Intergovernmental Panel for Climate Change. And this is an amazing thing. The report itself is 3,700 pages long. I've read the majority of them, almost 2,000 pages. It's nerve-wracking. No one reads it. They have a 47-page uh, um, summary for decision-makers, which no one reads. Out of that, they take bullets, 
which can cover one page. That's about the amount that politicians can read and journalists. And they hand it to them, and they have bullets there. And so what you get is a, a, a filtered view of the real data. And you actually need to go to the data to find out what's going on, which I have. And this is what we see. In terms of uh, um, bad things that can happen, you know, they have a list here, heat waves and flooding and whatnot. And uh, uh, in the last century, the temperature has risen by about one degrees. This is the common number that is typically used. So what happened to bad things? Because temperature itself, you know, it's just a number. What are the effects on our lives? And well, heat waves have gone up, sure, because the globe is warming a little bit. I'm going to say something about that, don't worry. Heavy participation, more rain, medium confidence. That means some places yes, some places no. That, and you know, rain by itself is not a bad thing. Definitely not in Israel, for example. That's not a bad thing at all. However, they do find that there is no global increase in flooding. No global increase whatsoever. This is the statistical fact. Moreover, flooding is not a, a correlated with extreme rain. Because flooding is actually due to other things, like uh, sewage and roads and infrastructure and things like that. So no increase in flooding, no increase in meteorological droughts, no increase in hydrological droughts. There is something which they basically invented, which is called an ecological drought, and that's 50-50 chance, medium confidence. So the data doesn't show it, but it does not not show it. No increase in tropical cyclones, no increase in winter storms, hail storms, great winds. Basically, no increase in any bad meteorological event. That's the data. That's it. So, okay, but there must be something bad. Sure there is. Water are going up, right? The, 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 the sea level is rising. Well, this is the data, sea level as a function of year, and you see two things. First of all, you see that since roughly the beginning of the 20th century, sea level, global sea level has risen roughly in a constant rate. That's way before we started emitting any CO2 to the atmosphere. So it must have started before we did something about that. And then you can do something very, very complicated mathematically. You can actually divide the, the y-axis to the x-axis and get a rate of sea level rise. And then sums up to about 3.5 millimeters a year. Now, some of that is because the land is sinking. But 3.5 millimeters a year, that's the average number. That's also the number which is agreed upon in the IPCC report. That's 3.5 centimeters a uh, year, 35 centimeters, that's about this high, in a, mil in a century, in a hundred years. That's the imminent catastrophe. So I was, I was uh, an infantry soldier in the army. That's two sacks of sand that you put one on top of the other, and you're done with it. And you know, this is a picture of me in Amsterdam. Amsterdam is below sea level. The Netherlands itself quarter of it is constantly under sea level, and when the tide comes, it's half of it is under sea level. And they solve the problems with dikes and canals. You don't need high tech for that. You just need to think about the problem. And of course, it definitely uh, brings on some challenges. You know, coastal cities need to worry about this, and you need to plan ahead, and you need to build the infrastructure. But is this an imminent uh, a catastro catastrophe? I don't know. I just don't feel like it. The area of the area burned in in globally has gone down in the last 25 years by roughly a quarter. That's a fact. Heat waves. Well, heat waves have gone up, but actually, cold weather kills way way more people than heat. That's a fact. That's a, a, a statistical fact. This is from a paper published last year in the Lancet which was mentioned earlier. And you see, in developed countries, heat kills uh, roughly four times more than, uh, uh, sorry, cold weather kills four times more than heat. And in uh, uh, underdeveloped countries, no matter how hot they are, India, 
אפריקה, cold weather kills way, way, way more people than warm weather. And the reason is this is because we developed in, in, in the African savanna where our bodies are used to heat. If it's too hot, you stay in the shade, you drink some water, and you'll be fine. If it's cold, if it's sub-zero temperatures for three, four nights in a row, and you don't have the power to heat your home, you will die. Or drink water. You will die. I think the most important statistic is this. Humans have basically solved the problem of climate. If you look at the statistics, we have decreased the rate of mortali mortality for cl from climate-related events by 98% over the last 100 years. That's the statistic. That's the number. This is a fact. And we did this because we can use power to build our lives better. We can build fortified homes. We can build better sewage. We can have new technology. All this is done by power. So as Alex Epstein says, and this is a quote I like very much, it's not that we are taking an excellent climate and we're ruining it. It's actually the other way around. We've taken something which was always bad for us. Climate was always against us. And in the last century, we were actually able, with power and, and wealth and uh, uh, ingenuity, we were actually able to make it convenient. And in the world, globally, meteorological events are no longer a global threat. This is the statistics. So if you try to quantify uh, climatic events, it kind of looks like there's no climate crisis, right? Of course, there are challenges. Of course, there are problems. But there's a very big difference between a problem and a crisis. Problem you need to approach. Crisis, you need to stop everything you're doing and fix that. And I'm, I'm, con I'm trying to persuade you that it's not the, first, the second one, it's the first one. Now, there's another way to quantify things. And of course, in a room full of economics, or economists, I'm burging into an open door. And this is, of course, asking what it does to the GDP. And you can actually do that, right? Uh, uh, the Great Depression uh, uh, reduced the GDP, global uh, 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 GDP, by 30% in five years. This was a real disaster. People were starving in the United States. That's amazing. The, the subprime uh, crisis reduced global GDP by 4.3%. The COVID crisis reduced global GDP by about 5 to 7% in two years. That's a big number. It affects people's lives. And how much will global warming cost? Right? So I'm not an economist, but people have done the calculation. First, I don't know if I should have put it here or in the previous uh, section, but the, the loss, losses from a, a, a meteorological events normalized to the income have been going down, not up. Of course, the nominal value has been going up, but because we are becoming richer and we live in coastal areas and so on. But the uh, normalized cost is going down. But the cost of climate change was actually uh, uh, calculated by various people. The most famous of them is William Nordhaus, who won the Nobel Prize for uh, developing these methods, and Professor Richard Toll, whom I had the pleasure of talking a few times, and, and Chris Hope. And they all have different models and, and different ways they do that. I'm not going to go into, into the details, because they all give the same result. And this is the result. When the temperature will hit roughly three degrees, which is you know, predicted to be around the end of the century, GDP will go down by around 3%. And all uh, models kind of agree uh, uh, on that. But by the end of the century, we're going to have economic growth, right? because economies work. So if you calculate the, the cumulative effect, you realize that if there were no climate at all, if we lived in climatic heaven, if every, all, 
every place in the, in the world would, would be San Diego, then uh, the, the global GDP would rise by four and a half, uh, uh, multiplied by four and a half, so 450%. But if we do nothing about climate change, nothing at all, there will be a catastrophe. We will not be 4.5 times richer, but only 4.34 times richer, which is a delay of about eight years. And you know where these data are coming from? From the uh, second part of the IPCC report from 2013. It's there. It just didn't make the cut to the, uh, uh, to, the pol to the summary for policymakers. Why? Because if it made the cut, you know, we would not be in the battle of our lives. And this is without anyone doing anything about climate, which is, of course, not the way people work, right? We always try to make our lives better. Now, now fueled by these winds of panic and catastrophe, we constantly hear that we need to provide more renewable energy. And when people say renewable, they talk about wind and solar energy. They don't talk about other forms of renewable. Many of the Greens are opposed to, for example, hydroelectric energy because you, know, you need to change the course of a river or something like that. And definitely they're opposed to nuclear energy. Although I hear more and more uh, uh, people actually promoting that, and we can discuss this later. And this uh, uh, winds of panic have made a lot of damage. Let me uh, uh, give you a few examples. Well, before I give you an example, we need to understand that wind and solar power have two main physical characteristics, which cannot be changed, because this is how they're built. The first one is that they are very low in power density. That's the power per unit area that you can uh, supply. First of all, they scale two-dimensionally because solar panels are flat. They're two-dimensional objects. And second, it's just a low form of a, a low in energy density. So you need huge, huge areas to supply, for an example, 30% of Israel electricity from solar panels, you're going to need to cover 5% of the open space in Israel with solar panels. The second thing is that because they are low in power density, they are high in material requirement. Because something's got to give, you need to get extract that power somehow. So you need a lot of material. In, in, in the case of solar power, that's polysilicon and lead and cadmium and other materials that go into the solar panels. In the case of wind power, that's rare earth metals and, and uh, uh, things like that and huge amounts of concrete. A lot of material. Now that material has to come from somewhere, right? You need to dig it out of the ground. So in many ways, trying to build solar panels to protect the environment actually makes it worse. But it's in China, we don't care. The entire supply chain for solar panels and wind turbines is now in China. We're talking about three freedom, but we are submitting our electricity to the hands of Chinese bureaucrats, and they don't care about the environment. The regulation there is way, way worse than in the US and in the Western world. So the first character is that it's a, a, a low on power density. The second characteristic is that it's intermittent. It shuts up, it starts and stops whenever the wind is blowing, and the solar panel only shines on daytime. I checked, nowhere on Earth there is sunlight in the, in, at night. This is a research I did. <laughs> so you need to overcome these. And when, when you think about the, the uh, power system, our needs of power, you need to realize four things. I wrote that down so I don't forget. The first thing is that we need power all the time. All the time. Big cities, which is where m more than half of where humanity lives, at nighttime use about 70% of the daytime peak. So you need to supply that power from somewhere. The second thing is that we need a lot of it. We need a lot of power. 
not only the Western world needs power, but the developing world will need power. And this must come from somewhere. And if you're going to build it from a low density power source, maybe that's not a good way. Now, big power plants cannot be turned on and off very, very quickly. You just can't do that. These are really big machines. They have huge turbines that circle around at 1,000 circles per second. And you just can't turn them on and off instantly. So you build small uh, uh, power plants, which are typically run by gas. They can be turned on and off, but they are very, very wasteful. So you burn a, a fuel where you, sh where you could avoid that. And the last thing we need to remember is that we currently have no way to store a, a power reliably and in large quantities. There's just no way technologically to do that. A lot of people are working on it, present included, but we just don't know how to do that. So all these things uh, uh, lead to the fact that when you push unreliable sources heavily, you both do not reduce any emissions, and you increase the cost. And that's an important thing, because when you increase the cost of power, you increase the cost of everything. Because everything relies on power. It's the food we eat. It's the water we drink. It's the industry that we do. It's the high-tech industry. It's the universities that we sit on. It's the cultural institutions. It's the healthcare system. Everything relies on power. And when you make it costlier, you increase the uh, cost of living. And that is bad for everyone, especially for the poor people, of course. So um, the curious incident of Germany, Germany started its Energiewende, a program to replace fossil fuels with wind power mostly. That started around 2000. They spent around a trillion euros on this, uh, slightly less, 800 billion euros or something, some unbelievable number. And what you see here on the uh, uh, yellow line is the percentage of renewable, or we should call them unreliable power. Now, this is kind of tricky because some of that is biofuel, which is just crops which are grown and then burned. They, of course, reduce nothing in terms of emission, it's just I don't know why they do that, honestly. And about 27 or 30 percent of the power averaged comes from wind power. That's pretty amazing, right? So the Germans can do it. Anyone can do that. Well, not quite. What you see here is the intermittency. What you see on the top is the amount of installation installed, so a, a power capacity. This is the red line on the top. And these blue peaks is how much power was actually produced by the wind turbines. So you can see with your eye the intermittency of this uh, a source. And you can see something more important. The, the black line on the top is the average, right? the linear regression. And this is the linear regression of the output. And they don't have the same slope. Think about that. The more you install power, that doesn't mean that you can get more reli unreliable power from the same source at the same rate. Because every kilowatt of power generated from an unreliable source has to be backed up by a reliable source. That's just the way the engineering goes. So you can't do that. And when you plug in the numbers, you actually see an amazing thing. You see that, OK, I need to explain this figure. This is total power, not just electricity, but total power generated in Germany. And then I take the total emissions of CO2, right? This is the goal of, 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 of this whole thing, right, to reduce emissions. But you take the total primary energy uh, production, you uh, divide the total emissions by the total energy production, you, you get how much CO2 was emitted per kilowatt hour equivalent. And what you see is as they start pushing renewable energies, the actual amount of CO2 per kilowatt hour equivalent goes up. 
That's an unbelievable fact, which no one talks about. Because you have to burn fossil fuels, and you have to burn them more and less efficiently to back up your unreliable power. And of course, this uh, um, affects prices. So these are the prices in a, a select European countries before the invasion to Ukraine. And I will comment on that, of course. This is before. What happened is that they had a, a, a slow wind. So wind output goes down, prices go up. And if you look at the prices, they went up. Look at the price in, in, in Germany. It went up from around 30 uh, uh, euro cents per megawatt or something like that up to 150. Four times more. You can imagine what would happen in Israel if prices of energy would go up four times more? A family with a, with a medium income, which now pays 800 shekels every two months, would have to pay 1,600 or 2,000 shekels every two months. People would riot in the streets, and rightfully so. There's an interesting thing here. France and Norway basically have no, renew no renewable energy, no unreliable energy. France produces over 75% of its power from nucle nuclear plants, and Norway, 94% of its power comes from hydroelectric plants. And yet their prices went up. Well, because they have borders with Germany and with the UK. Ger France is selling electricity to Germany. Norway is selling a, a power to the UK. Prices in the UK go up. They go to the neighbors to buy electricity. The neighbors can ask for more, right? Supply and demand. So prices go up everywhere. There's a ripple effect to this crazy pursuit for unreliable energy sources. So what will be the future of power? Right? This is the question. Well, I don't know about the future. Since the, the first temple was uh, uh, broken down, you know, prophecy was given to children and fools. I'm not going to try to make any prophecies. Of course I am. Yeah, but, but we can see what happened. And this is from Renewable Energy 21, Global Status Report. You can download it. All the data is there. Well, from 10, 10 years ago to now, 80% of world's power comes from fossil fuels. That has not changed. Well, I mean, is there like a huge conspiracy? Are s people, you know, me and other, you know, the Koch brothers and all the, 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 the oil lords sitting in a room and thinking, how are we going to prevent these beautiful, renewable, natural sources to, to be abundant? No. It's the people and the countries realizing that power is essential. And they're going to get it whatever it takes. And if it takes burning fossil fuels, then they're going to burn fossil fuels. Modern renewables did get a little push, which costs somewhere between one and two trillion dollars globally. But it's a very tiny push. If you look at this 11.2%, then 3.3%. Six out of it is hydropower. That's great, but you know, in Israel, you know, we have the Yarkon. <laughs> Not great. 4.2% of this is solar, geothermal, heat, biomass. That's you know, rooftop heaters and things like that. Also great. 1% is biofuels for transport. Not so great, but okay. And around 2.4% is all the rest combined. This is, these are the numbers, and, and, you hear, and you hear environmentalists and economists and activists and politicians say, what are you talking about? The world is, is you know, driving, going to, towards renewables. Well, it's not. It's not. It's staying in the fossil fuels because power is of essence. And I want to point out again, this is 8.7, that's the others. Do you know what that others means? This is cow dung. 
This is cow dung, which is uh, squeezed into pellets and used for burning homes. 800 pe million people around the world use this as their primary energy source. This is the central challenge. Not reducing CO2, not, a, a, I don't know, changing the climate or whatever. This is the central challenge. Bringing the blessing of power to those people around the world that do not have it. This is what we need to worry about. And when people become rich and have power, and they have plenty of power, they start to worry about the environment. Because if you don't know how you're going to heat your food or how you're going to feed your children, you couldn't care less if there's sewer in the streets. That's just a fact of life. Um, yes, so I'm going back to this. We know where we need a power. We know this is. I'm wrapping it up, yes. And you can see it. You can see these are CO2 emissions by year. And you can see the wealthy Europeans, the white nations, and you can see Africa basically not emitting any CO2. And I'm, I'm finishing in a second. You know there was a, a meeting in Glasgow, CO2, the climate summit, the, the, the uh, uh, um, costliest cocktail party in the world. Nothing came out of it, which is great, except for one agreement that was actually signed. There was one agreement that was signed. Belgium and the Netherlands and Norway and UK and a bunch of European countries together with the big uh, uh, financial institutes, the World Development Bank and the European Development Bank and the African Development Bank, signed a treaty that they will not invest in infrastructure if it has fossil fuels in it. Belgium. But they're doing that for the benefit of the, of the African nations, right? They're so good at it. That's unbelievable. And they're denying the African nations f from the wealth needed to build this infrastructure. And they're keeping them a, a poor. They are. Because power is an essential ingredient to wealth. Now, of course, I need to, to connect this to liberty. So I, I made a slight change. Life, liberty, and the pursuit of power. Of course, liberty is a musag hamakmak. You know, it's a tangible thing, right? We don't really know what liberty is. I think it's well described in the Declaration of Independence of the United States, right? The each man's right for life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness as he see fits. Now, when people are locked in poverty, when they have no power to supply their needs, they cannot pursue happiness really. Because they need to pursue food and shelter and clean water. And this takes any priority. And in order to uh, uh, um, make life better for everyone, we need to pursue power. That's the key ingredient. Now, uh, I, I'm going to finish with the challenges, of course, because you know it, 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 it's not easy. There's, a, there's something called the, the energy trilemma here, right? And the energy trilemma is that you want to supply power which is reliable, cheap, and clean. And of course, everyone in the Western world takes the priority upside down. Clean first, whatever clean means, because it's not really clean. It's, it's clean. I, I, the gut feeling is that it's clean. It's not really clean by any means, but you know it feels clean. And then let's try to make it as reliable, and we don't care about cost. Right? That's what happened in Europe. And this push to reliable uh, is an amazing example of that. And that led to the situation where Germany is now buying 40% of its power or its fuel from Russia. And therefore, it cannot do anything regarding, for example, the Russian-Ukrainian conflict. Because what are they going to do? The Russians can simply cut off the power line, and there will be no power in Germany. Who can afford that? No one can afford that. Right. I think I'm going to stop here. OK. So let me just wish you live long and prosper. And you need power to do that.
before the five, we'll take some questions. Few questions? Yes. I think that I will take uh, my uh, discretionary as a moderator to, to ask the first question. Um, I think you explain us the, the what. Can you also say something about the why? Why is this uh, global um, campaign to stop global warming uh, if this is the situation? So my expertise in theoretical physics, so I'm stepping beyond my expertise here, so my opinion is as good as, as, good as anyone. But it's the same thing that drives free countries to look up to China. It's the same thing that um, drives people to extensive progressivism, right? And to culture, cancel culture. I think this is a, a congregation of three major forces. There's a cricket behind me or something, I don't know. There are uh, uh, three things happening. First of all, there's a lot of money in, in renewables. A lot of money, that's fine. If it would be the private sector, that would be great. But the entire industry of, of uh, unreliable power is subsidized by governments. So there's a lot of things going on there, a lot of money. And of course, politicians always want to be a, a, on the good side rather than the bad side. So the, of course, we want clean air and clean air. Who's the politician who's going to say, I don't care about the environment? And of course, there is the religious aspect. I think, and this is a thesis, not my thesis, you know, people like Michael Schellenberger and others raised this thesis, in that the wealthy, white, a, a power, a, 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 a fluent world, people are becoming more secular, and there's no vacuum in the human psyche. So we need some meaning, and people, go to meaning to look for meaning in Gaia, in saving the planet. Conveniently forgetting that, you know, third of the world does not live like them. And I think this a, a, a mixture of three forces has led us to where we are now. Now a, a note on this, we do have proof from the 20th century that humanity is capable of collective stupidity. And I think we are, you know, in a place where this collective stupidity is uh, uh, endangering us and hurting our lives, and there will be a pushback, like there always is. Ah, the moderator went out. Okay. okay. Any other questions? Take the mic, please. Please. Um, I'm not an expert, but you said before that that cold weather kills more people. Yes. Do you, do you take in consideration skin cancer? I'm not sure about if I'm right. The answer is yes. Everything is taken uh, accounted for. This uh, I'm not. It's not me saying that. Right? I'm just quoting a paper from The Lancet. And this is their job, to uh, uh, evaluate excess deaths due to hot and cold weather. I'm not a statistician of mortality rates, so I, do not, I, I cannot judge the paper. I did have some people do that, and they tell me that the paper is quite fine. Ariel Karlinski, right? which we, some of us know. Yes, so, and yes, so the, everything related to, to hot weather, everything related to cold, cold weather. Of course, there's a margin of error, but even so, four, four times to 20 times more. Ma? <laughs> If we don't uh, deny the catastrophe now, in the future, in 100 years from now, there will be a catastrophe. That is incorrect. But you said like the, the level uh, of the water are raising. Okay? Yes. It should affect the water temperature, it should 
Fact, yes, uh, yes, yes. All these things are taken into account. For example, in the... Arbaim uh, centimeter. 40 centimeters in a hundred years. Uh, sure, and you need to, to be prepared for that. Fine. That is incorrect. Tel Aviv has suffered in the last century 0.7 millimeters a year. That's seven centimeters in a century. We say 100 years. In 100 years, seven centimeters. What will happen in the future? I don't know. No one knows. It's just something that we don't know as people. We can only use data from the past, right? That's how science works. So, and, and even so, 40 centimeters, right? That's a, as I said, you need to work for that. But, okay, is that a catastrophe? Is that an imminent catastrophe? No, 100 years. It could be if you do nothing. And then you realize it 100 years from now, but people don't work like that. What do you, what do you say? Yeah. What? what do you say? It makes people not to do anything. Because well, did I say not to do anything? I actually said very specifically something you need to be concerned about. I, I said it with my own words. It's something you need to think about. It's a problem. You need to work. You need to build barriers and build canals and, you know, make the city a better equipped to deal with the sea level rise. But okay, do it. If you're gonna put a solar panel in Arad, that's not gonna help the, the sea level rise in Tel Aviv. It's not gonna do it. Okay. Uh, last question. The supply of the fossil fuel. Right, that's a great question. I get that a lot. So I asked, what about the supplies of fossil fuels? So, a natural resource is not a resource until we know how to use it, right? When Napoleon and the Duke of Wellington fought each other and, you know, they had a list of what are the resources available to us, they did not count oil as one of them, right? Because they did not know what to do with it. It was useless. Uh, uh, materials become resources when we know what to do with them. So. We have oil for at least 60 years. We have coal for 300 years. We have gas now, natural gas right now, the known supplies for at least 50 or 60 years. But that doesn't mean anything because when we need something, we look for it, right? We found a, a, a natural gas off the coast of Natania, for God's sake. I mean, who knew, right? Uh, uh, in, in 15 years ago, the United States were importing uh, fuel. And then a group of smart engineers in, in, in Pennsylvania basically realized how you can push a pipeline like this, and it goes underground like this, and basically solve the problem of fracking. And within five years, the US became an exporter of fossil fuels. So any number we give now is going to be hard to measure. Now, we do have other sources of power. We have uranium for 300 years for the entire population of the globe. We have thorium for 10,000 years if we just had the technology and the engineering to actually use it and to use the spent fuel from power reactors. So there's an abundance of energy sources on Earth. We just need to know how to use them, and then they become resources. OK. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.